how do you fit 10 years of research into 17 minutes? There's only one way. You employ superheroes. All right, I know you're wondering, that's a very odd couple. Um, and up until now, only Spider-Man has enjoyed the status of a superhero. It is my goal today that at the end of my talk, you will regard both of these as superheroes and together as the best team that's ever existed. You ready? All right, so like all superheroes, they have a very, very worthy cause and a very worthy opponent. Their arch nemesis is infectious disease, or actually it's spread. Those of you who are scientists right now are thinking, girly, you're a little too late. We already have this covered. We have a system that protects us from the spread of infectious diseases. It's called vaccination. And you're right. Next to antibiotics, immunization has been named the greatest achievement of medicine. Vaccinations save approximately 3 million lives every year. But what about the rest of us? All right, so we live in a very developed world and whenever there's a scare, our governments will actually pull together vaccination hubs. That top image, that's in 2009 during the swine flu scare um, in Milwaukee. People waited close to 10 hours to get vaccinated. If you're thinking of an infectious disease spreading, do you necessarily want to wait online with thousands of your closest neighbors? Especially if maybe the disease symptoms do not show until a little bit later? All right, so let's say that that's just one issue. Then you make it inside, and they're gonna get a glass vial of the vaccine. Where do they get it from? A refrigerator, typically. They have to draw it up into a hypodermic needle and use a sterile syringe, both of which have to be disposed of at the end of your injection, right? And we can't just throw them into the trash, especially if we have the threat of a bloodborne pathogen spread. So we have to dispose of them through biohazardous waste. And now the biggest component of the system is that faceless hand. It requires a medically trained person, typically a physician or a nurse, to administer the shot. Right? We've all been there, done that. Well, the world we live in today could be very well described by this quote that's as old as I am today. We no longer have remote destinations because, as you can tell from the map of the major airports in the world, there's no such thing as isolation. And what was so well captured is that an event that occurs far away could be on your doorstep tomorrow. And I think we've all lived it last year during the Ebola scare. Ebola is not the most prevalent or most infectious disease. It only spreads from the infected individuals to one to two people. We have diseases that spread a lot more rapidly. And one other thing we know is that even though we have controls set up at the airports, it traveled here. Do you know how much it cost us in a matter of four months? One billion dollars. All right. It's going to get a little bit darker before there's light at the end of the tunnel. But here's another map of the world. And there are many different ways I could have captured the disparities between um, medical infrastructure around the world. But probably the most stark is the ratio of physicians to patients. As you can tell, majority of the world is not as privy as we are. And think about Eastern Africa, where Ebola happened. 
the numbers can be as bad as one to 75,000. Remember how I told you in Milwaukee, people waited for about 10, 12 hours to get vaccinated? One to 400 here. How long would you have to wait there? Would you even have access to a clinic? Is everybody bummed out? <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the reality. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not all bad. Actually, we have made a pretty significant discovery within the last decade. During the bird flu scare in Hong Kong in 2006, they endured um, shortages of the stockpile of the vaccine. And so they decided, what happens if we try and take advantage of the immunocompetent region of our skin? And instead of jabbing people into the muscle, we now inject the vaccine into the skin. They got away with 10% of the vaccine by doing so. Therefore, we're able to vaccinate 10 times as many people. Isn't that great? Well, if you think intramuscular injections require medically trained personnel to efficiently deliver a vaccine into the skin via an injection, is a whole new ball game. And so it still does not help with that one to 75,000, right? But now we know that skin has the ability to really protect everybody with a much smaller dose. However, everybody around the world hearing about this went ahead and started figuring out how we can maybe develop something that the patients can administer themselves that does not necessarily require that hypodermic needle, syringe, biohazardous waste, refrigeration. And so we looked at skin. It turns out that as the largest organ of your body, it's been designed very well to protect you. Not only does it hold things inside, but it does not allow penetration of anything too large. Its outermost layers look like bricks and mortar. Do you agree? They're up there. It's called the stratum corneum. It's only about 20 micrometers thick, so very skinny. Yet, this is the region that does not allow penetration of large molecules. When you have an impermeable membrane, what do you do? You figure out a way to work around it. And so, majority of the world went out and tried to figure out new ways of stabbing skin. Maybe now we no longer need needles that are very long. Maybe now we can get away with shorter needles that can penetrate this impermeable membrane. That's where we started too. But we very quickly discovered that given the superheroes that we brought to the table, maybe that's not a necessity. 500 Daltons is what we were told was the limit. Nothing over a 500 Dalton, um, so only very small molecules could penetrate. As I said, superheroes are key, and possible things, right? Well, let me tell you how the superheroes come into play. And I probably am gonna break a few hearts we did not actually employ Spider-Man. But we did create our own spider webs. And look, there's me. <laughs> All right, I don't shoot spider webs out of my hands. It involves using um, actually a very simple um, machinery that I was able to build myself. But what's so special about these spider webs, all right, this is the interactive portion. Everybody grab onto your hair, pick out one strand, Grab onto someone else's hair if you don't have any. <laughs> you feel how thin that feels? Imagine something that's a hundred or a thousand times skinnier. Each one of these threads is that skinny. Inside of it, we can actually throw the protein. And what turns out is that these large, large molecules that are proteins, once they're stuck in the fiber, they kind of can't really do anything to themselves meaning they remain stable for a very long period of time, 
When we compared their stability inside of these fibers to that of sitting in a liquid, the liquid denatured within the first three weeks, meaning there was no protein active. At room temperature, this patch maintained the protein stability for eight weeks. In refrigeration, this patch remained active for 20 weeks, possibly even longer. We don't know because we never, ever expected that result. So that's one superhero, and we already knew he was a superhero. So, um, But the other one is probably making you wonder even more. Uh, so it turns out that the polymer that we employ, called polyvinylpyrrolidone, also known as PVP, was the first hairspray ever used. The image I have up there, you know those huge beehive hairdos? It turns out that if you walked outside and it was a humid day, your hair would swell up because PVP can absorb up to 40% of its own weight in atmospheric moisture. Not a good look if you're living on Long Island in the summer. <laughs> I've learned that. And actually, the first competitor made fun of it and called it cotton candy hair. All right, but so what doesn't work in the hairspray industry maybe is a key to a patch being able to deliver vaccines into the skin. And so just like the hair, it turns out that our patches can also absorb moisture and swell and begin to dissolve and release the vaccine that's locked inside. And so what we hoped would happen, if you could look at the image up top, you have your spider web with the vaccine locked inside. Below is that brick and mortar structure of your skin. And we have a lot of moisture that's locked within the skin. But what happens is that the moisture that's locked within the skin can actually get drawn up to the surface of the patch, right? Just like I showed you in that previous image. Once it's there, the patch begins to dissolve. And now you have a very, very hydrated gel sitting on top of dehydrated skin. Pure osmosis. Same thing that happens to you when you take a long bath or a shower. The skin cells begin, the moisture has to go back inside, and as it, as it does it, the skin cells begin to spread. And they allow for penetration of molecules that are much larger than that 500 Dalton rule. And we knew this because we did experiment on top of experiment on top of experiment as far as delivery. But then we said, can we actually vaccinate? Can we cause the same immune response as an intramuscular injection? And remember that 500 Dalton rule? Well, we decided to look at something a little bit bigger, only 250 times bigger. Go big or go home, right? Why not? And this is what happened. It turns out that when you wear a patch for 24 hours, you have a very similar immune response to someone else who instead received the intramuscular injection. When you see this result as a scientist, the first thing you do is not believe it. And you run it over and over and over again until you finally have to come to grips with the fact that 10 years of your life, 10 years of sacrifice and hard work, maybe amounted to something. And you just weep. Trust me. <laughs> but once you pick up the pieces, then you go, wait, I just delivered something that was never supposed to happen. 250 times the rule? That's impossible. Can we deliver something bigger? <laughs> And so we looked at the largest thing we could find, and it was a fluorescently labeled protein, and we threw it on top of the skin for 24 hours. And then we looked under the microscope, and guess what? We found fluorescence sitting 200 micrometers from the surface. It penetrated, remember, that 20 micrometers of the top brick and mortar? 
we had no problem. Holy crap. <laughs> I realize it's early. It's only been 10 years. Still a lot more research to be done. But I want you to think about the future. Because that is what keeps me up at night. What if, in the future, if you're in one of those remote villages, your vaccine is delivered to you via a drone? You look at it, and it's a Band-Aid. Wow. Even my five-year-old niece can put on her own Band-Aid. It weighs next to nothing. It's stable, even at room temperatures. We no longer live in isolation. What if from now on, all vaccines were going to be Band-Aids? You, you want to see me put it on? Might as well, right? And look, I'm going to get to put a Band-Aid on where I have no hair so that when I pull it off later, it doesn't hurt. We all know that pain. But could it be that it's this simple? We never penetrate into any sort of bodily fluid. No biohazardous waste. No refrigeration. You can put it on yourself. And I know right now everybody's thinking about East Africa and that one to 75,000. Well, I want you to think about yourselves. One to 400. Maybe next time there's a scare of a pandemic, you don't have to stand on line with thousands of your neighbors, hoping that none of them are sick. Maybe a drone could bring you a Band-Aid, and you could just slap it on yourself, and maybe from now on, all of the vaccines are just going to be Band-Aids and lollipops. <laughs> Thank you very, very much.